I don't see my face. I'm here. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Audrey Russo, and today it's business as usual. I am greeting you all from North Park. And uh, so if you see these you know, beautiful surroundings here, today we're really doing remote, remote. And the reason, one of the reasons why is we're actually having our first social distancing um, engagement for TechFest. And if you want to know anything about TechFest, we'll make sure that we put that in the chat. So thank you all for being here. I am really excited about today, as I am each and every day. And I am joined by Jonathan Kirsting. He is our Vice President of All Things Media at the Tech Council, and he's going to be helping us with the questions. And then I am going to, just a few things about today's call, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors. Our sponsors include Huntington Bank. They've been with us along the whole journey. I think today's our 103rd day of us doing business as usual. And right now we're not seeing any end in sight. And uh, based on all the things that are happening right around us in our world, we feel that it's really important for us to stay connected as a community and to make sure that we're providing you sort of bite-sized access to people who are leading and addressing <laughs> problems as well as being relevant. So thank you all for being here. And you know, we have this Tech Fest today. I just want to tell you a little bit about it. It's a three-day Tech Fest program. And uh, if you're interested in visiting with us, we're at the Harmer Pavilion in North Park, it's right near the pool. And um, we have the first 40 people who will join us today. We're giving out t-shirts. We're gonna welcome to have, you know, join us for a drink and have a snack. Masks, you know, are absolutely required, social distancing as well. But it is a conference that's really focused on dedication to software development professionals. And the conference portion of TechFest actually starts tomorrow. So the details about that are techfest.com. And we're joined, we actually have sponsors there, IQ Inc. and Open Art. Sun is, is the president and CEO of Highmark. And uh, we, Highmark is actually, believe it or not, the Tech Council is in like our, almost our 30th, I believe. And Highmark is actually one of the friendships that goes really deep and they're very, very active with us. And if you don't know David Holmberg, you're really going to have, a, you're really in for a treat today to meet the leadership of Highmark and to get a little peek inside into David. And then we also have Joyce Bender. She is one, also a long-standing member of the Tech Council and she has been involved with us almost from the beginning. She's the founder and president of Bender Consulting. And we are going to be talking about a few key issues today, including the status of our region's healthcare system as we ed, ed, enter mid-August. How could this be mid-August? But it is. And they're going to be talking also about an initiative called Highmark 3030, which is particularly timely <laughs> given the recent celebrated 30th anniversary of the American Disabilities Act, which was signed on July 27, 26, 30 years ago. So I'm going to bring on David first, and then we will have Joyce. So David, good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate you getting dressed up. And you can see that I am not. I'm wearing my Pirates t-shirt in good spirit. And uh, mm -hmm. I want, I just, let's just jump in with you. Let's talk about 3030 and talk about why that matters to you. And then, you know, at some point we'll jump in and talk about the health system. We'll talk about where the health system stands in terms of current COVID, et cetera. So I'm passing the baton to you. Thank you, Audrey. I mean, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to get dressed up. Now that I know that you have barbecue, <laughs> I will be getting rid of the jacket soon and I'll be right there. We're very excited about the, um, you know, the 3030 program or the Highmark 3030 program. And what it's really about is giving people opportunities um, as an organization, we truly believe that, you know, a diverse workforce uh, makes us better and, you know, makes us better able to you know, execute the mission that we've been on. And, you know, 25 years ago, uh, the leadership at Highmark partnered with Joyce Bender to develop a program, you know, a very purposeful, intentional program to bring people with disabilities into the workforce. And I'm proud to say that 25 years later, um, you know, it continues to be an ongoing part of our culture. And, you know, the, the concept of Highmark 3030 is, is really very straightforward. This is the 30th anniversary of the American with Disabilities Act. 
And you know, when Joyce and I had a breakfast, uh, eating protein bars one day instead of real food, mm -hmm. um, you know, we talked through what do we need to do uh, to help people you know, who have disabilities find you know, uh, sustainable, successful work opportunities. And, you know, and we hatched this concept of 30-30, which was to hire 30 people with disabilities and over the course of, of this year um, and bring them into the workforce and give them you know, a hand up, not a handout, and give them opportunities that maybe um, they hadn't had a chance to have, uh, but also to spend the time and develop them so that they could be successful in the long term. So uh, we're very excited about it. You know, it's it's an honor of the 30th anniversary of the American and uh, with Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, but it's also part of who we are as an organization. And obviously, being in healthcare, it's even more important. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'm back. So. So first of all, thank you. Thank you for continuing that late that leadership. It's been going on at Highmark for a long time, even prior to your arrival at Highmark. But you have really accelerated the engagement, and we're thrilled to hear about. Um, we switch a little bit. I just want to bring on Joyce Bender. Joyce Bender, I mentioned earlier, she's the CEO and founder of of Bender Consulting, and she's going to talk a little bit about Bender Consulting, her own journey. And we're gonna, I'm gonna actually ask her, where was she 30 years ago when this was signed? So uh, Joyce? Yes, thank you very much, Audrey. And I wanna mention before we start that I wanna thank you for being a national leader for people with disabilities and supporting me in my crusade from the beginning, so thank you. My journey started with a seizure at a movie theater one evening. My uh, disability had been misdiagnosed, so I did not know I had epilepsy, and I had a seizure at the movie theater and hit the floor so hard I fractured my skull. I broke the bones in my right inner ear. I had an intracranial brain hemorrhage, with life-saving brain surgery. And this is when I find out, you know, that I have epilepsy. And that one night at the movie theater, that one seizure would change the rest of my life. Because after I, and this was in 1985, after I got back to work, um, it was not long after that, that I found out that 90% of people with disabilities were not counted in the workforce and had the highest unemployment of any group. So I started doing volunteer work for, uh, you know, the next 10 years, well, in nine years. And in 1990, as David mentioned, I went to Highmark and I said, look, we have this extremely high unemployment. It's shameful. Um, but I need someone to stand behind me. I'm going to start a for-profit company for two reasons. Number one, a rich healthcare benefits program, which I still have today. And number two, no pity. You know, people with disabilities need paychecks, not pity. And I said, uh, at that time, it was Bill Lowry that to do this, would I need someone to stand behind me. Would you consider bringing on board six th people with disabilities on contract and keep them for three years. Now, I've got to tell you, even today, that would be hard for me to go to a company and say, hey, six entry level people with disabilities to be in your IT department. And by the way, keep them for three years. And you know what? It only took Highmark one day to say yes. And since that day, every CEO has stood behind me in employing people with disabilities through, of course, David, who's taken it even a step further. I will mention about him. He's probably the only CEO in America that at one of those breakfasts, he was barely seated when he said, hey, Joyce, I don't see enough wheelchairs in the lobby. I don't see enough people signing. I don't see enough service dogs. I think, oh my God, imagine if every CEO would start a conversation uh, that way. But this is how it all started. Uh, now I have a national company, Vendor Consulting Services, that 
focuses on the search and employment recruitment of people with disabilities in fields like IT, finance, engineering, um, and other business disciplines nationally. And we also have a software product that we now sell iDisability teaching companies how to work with and communicate uh, with people with disabilities. Uh, it's, it's been a journey. I started 25 years ago. So in 1990, think about this. It was only five years after my accident. So, you know, I was working at that time at my own company. Uh, I was in executive search. I so wish I could have been uh, there when the ADA was signed. Uh, but, you know, I, I have been on a crusade since then. I speak around the world as an expert on the employment of people with disabilities. And I live with epilepsy and a hearing loss. And as I said, it all started one night, one seizure at a movie theater. Oh, hang on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you for being so candid about your own personal journey. How many people are employed with you right now? Well, at all times, we have about 50 to 60 people because they roll off, you know, and join a company or we put ah. them at a company. But we have found employment now for over 1,000 people, you know, during that time period. Uh, wow. You know, it is so exciting to see people with disabilities finally, you know, have dignity, respect. You know, we have this untapped labor pool that companies are not, you know, using. Uh, people with disabilities want to work. Uh, they can work, uh, but people have to give them a chance. And by the way, sadly today, it is 70% of people with disabilities not counted in the workforce. So as you can see, we have captioning, we have uh, transportation, we have housing, we have all these things, but we have a long way to go to see that needle move with employment. So, you know, what's, it's amazing. First of all, it's amazing. And let's think about this. We, we haven't come that far, right? When you think about it, we've worked really hard on architectural design ramps and, mm -hmm. and the length of you know uh, hallways and accessibilities to bathrooms but we still have a lot of work to go so i want to go to back to david and talk about what he wants the rest of us to think about in the community when he's talking about highmark 3030 so david sure audrey thank you i mean you know first of all um what we have in place now are the important elements that help make sure that it's a successful program. And so uh, there's continuing education that goes on and that's where the partnership with Joyce you know, is, is very important. We have a strong recruiting pipeline and, you know, and, and we're intentional about, you know, about doing this. Um, but you know, as Joyce said, you know, this isn't about pity. This is about um, tapping a workforce that um, mm -hmm. shows up, that's very loyal, um, that you know has strong work ethic, and is willing to um, you know to to learn and and be a part of the community that we have, and it's been successful. And so what we we hope you know in uh, today's conversation is that we can show um, or be a role model for maybe how other organizations could do it. You know, it's been a privilege to be a part of this. I mean, uh, um, periodically, national companies with the kinds of names that, you know, we all know have reached out through Joyce and said, okay, walk us through, how do you do this so that it, uh, so that people um, not only are successful, but that the organization embraces it. And there's a handful of things. And, and you know, uh, our intention with the Highmark 3030 program is to show that even in uh, an extraordinary time like we're in, uh, with, you know, with the COVID-19 crisis, et cetera, uh, that we can continue to put an emphasis uh, on a diverse, you know, workforce. And so, uh, in fact, this is one of the reasons why we developed the business resource groups that we have, which we have eight of them, and there's about a thousand people in them. Um, you know, the, you know, the disabilities, you know, group or the people with differences, there's 70 people in that group. 
And you know, all of these groups are making us better because they're helping us uh, match up our organization to the customers that we serve and also teaching us things that you, know, you and I may not know. Um, I mean, what it's like to be able to navigate a, a wheelchair in a city setting, those kinds of things. And so it's making us better as, a, as an organization. And, and you know, I think that there's an opportunity for all of us uh, to tap this workforce and take advantage of it. Okay, hang on. What are, can you hear me now? What are some of the um, surprises that people, you know, talk about when you've added people who have these differing abilities to the workforce? Well, in, in our case, and, and I'll certainly let, you know, Joyce speak because she's got, you know, you know the expertise, but um, as an employer, you know, I mean, uh, you know, some of the surprises, you know, are, are really, you know, some of the, um, some of the early stuff. I mean, one of the things that we've learned is that, um, you know, whoever the, this, this, these people's supervisors are, it's really important to make them part of the training and make them part of, of uh, the orientation. So, uh, so they understand, you know, maybe some of the differences in how, you know, they need to think about things. And, you know, probably the biggest surprise is the positive effect we've seen on the work teams. And my favorite story um, is, you know, we had a, a, an individual who uh, was disabled and, you know, took public transportation to come to work. Uh, I believe it was cerebral palsy, uh, but I don't remember. And, you know, all of a sudden, one day, they stopped showing up to work. And, you know, um, and the, the people on the team reached out and what they found out was the individual was being bullied at the bus stop. And, you know, and uh, while they were doing a terrific job for us, just getting from home to work was an ordeal. And so, and ultimately it was, it was stopping them from getting to work. Our team took it upon themselves to meet the bus every single day and make sure that that person had an escort walking them to the building. And we could not have been more proud of that because it just reflects who the organization is and it reflects, you know, the impact that, you know, that these folks have had on our organization and on the teams. Uh, and it just proves that, you know, that we all can be better by being inclusive. So true. So let's, let's just shift for a second. And what about some questions, Jonathan, before I start talking about COVID? Definitely. We've got some great questions here for you guys. I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. So from Mary Brogger, she's thank, first off, she thanks you for your leadership, both of you. And I want to see, um, as it relates to disability, employment, inclusion, and digital accessibility, what do you want to see happen in the next 30 years? Joyce? Well, obviously, what I want to see happen is that people with disabilities are in the workforce and that we don't have to have a high mark 3030. Someday is going to be here. We're going to look back on this and say, do you know we used to have these special programs where we were just asking people to hire people with disabilities? I'm hoping it won't be as long as it has been. You know, I want to see people with disabilities not only working, but in leadership roles at companies. See, that's where the rubber meets the road whenever you see them at a senior level. That would right. be the most important to me. Right. And so, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, uh, you know, I hope somewhere down the road, you know, that whoever is running the organization looks around and, you know, and doesn't see a lack of wheelchairs or people signing, but just thinks that it's normal and, you know, and just part of the culture and that it's so ingrained that, you know, that uh, uh, it's not a difference anymore. Right. Very much I so. feel, you know, I feel like we're at an inflection point in our society, but with the, com you know, with the combination of what's happening around the world around us, not just COVID, but all the issues that have really percolated in Black Lives Matter in terms of what it means to be, you know, at the table and to be included, that it's important to understand that the array of, of abilities matters. And I say abilities because really we're only all temporarily able-bodied. Joyce just gave us an example of what happened to her in just the snap at the movie theater. So I like to remind people that we're really, mm -hmm. you know, those of us who are not disabled, we really just are temporarily abled and uh, gifted with that right now. So I really, I've always appreciated Joyce's passion and what she has brought to the community. 
So I do want to talk about a little bit while I have you here, David, I really want to talk about, you know, COVID just, just a bit because, you know, we have you here and I thought I'd take advantage of that. You, here you are, you're running a big health system, which includes hospitals and insurance. And so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit. First of all, I want to make sure that you're okay, that you're taking care of yourself. And you told us early on that you were, that you are physically and emotionally taking care of yourself and, and requiring that of the people that work for you. So as much as that is possible, I understand. So let, can I do a check in with you on that? Sure, Audrey. First of all, I appreciate, I appreciate you asking. Um, I would tell you that, um, you know, this has been an extraordinary experience as a leader. It's been an extraordinary experience for all of us. Obviously, we're all dealing with, you know, uncertain times, both personally and professionally. And, you know, um, we are on a journey together. You know, as I said, have said to other groups, um, you know, COVID-19 doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't think about your politics. It doesn't think about uh, what kind of work you do. Um, it attacks us all. And, you know, and it's something that we all have to deal with. So as an organization, um, you know, we've taken the approach of we understand with the Allegheny Health Network, we're on the front lines and we have 17,000 people doing that. And then with Highmark, the insurance company, um, you know, we were built to withstand a pandemic and we were built to stand in the breach uh, when something like this happens. So it's, it's been an extraordinary seven day a week kind of an event, uh, starting back all the way back in late January when, you know, when it became very clear that we were headed toward a pandemic and, you know, that it was going to take a radical shift uh, in everything that we've done. And so part of that um, has been not only to take care of the people that we serve, both our members and our patients, but also to take care of our own people because we needed them to stand tall. We needed them to be available for um, clinicians to be available to take care of patients and the insurance people and other people to be available to make sure that we back backstopped the entire healthcare system. And so, um, so we've put a focus on, on you know, wellness. I mean, we moved 17,000 people to work at home in four days. And, you know, we've really tried to focus them uh, on, you know, their, their own health and well-being. Uh, you know, t using telemedicine, we went from 25, um, you know, 25 video visits a day to 4,000 uh, during the first round per day. Um, and, you know, uh, by the way, you know, 97% um, of those were with local con clinicians. The majority were primary care and then uh, behavioral and mental health care. And so we've tried to learn from that and also make that available to our own people uh, because this is taking a toll. This isn't just, you know, about physical health. Um, you know, some of the behavioral stuff and mental health that we're seeing within the region uh, is a reflection of all the pressure that people are feeling. So my simple you know, answer is, you know, we're trying to encourage our people to wear a mask, wash their hand all the time, wash their hands five times a day, uh, work out if you can, particularly outside, um, eat healthy and, and use common sense. And then wherever we can do help with that, we're trying to facilitate that. No, you definitely are. And one of the things that, you know, a lot of people don't understand around around the region what goes on behind closed doors and just you doing your work each and every day. It, it had to be the first week, and Jonathan can correct me if I'm wrong, it was had to be the first week that we had Cindy Hundorfin and Dr. Whiting on the show and talking about just actually what was happening up front live. You were supposed to be with us and then you got whisked away to have a conversation with um, someone from oh, yeah. the White House. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we really appreciate you just being with us right at the onset. But one of the things people need to understand, too, is that you're really providing a lot of resources for schools. And, you know, lots of the schools are in your system and use your services. And I know firsthand by talking to your leadership, the work that you're doing behind the scenes to make sure that there's really protocols and support in place by working with the county um, health department, Dr. Bogan. And, uh, you know, these are the kinds of things that they're working on each and every day, in addition to insurance and just sort of what one might think is regular health care and health services. So thank you for your leadership on that and appreciate you just giving us a little peek in. So I want to go back to Joyce really quick, unless Jonathan, there are some questions. Yeah. 
Definitely. So this is a great one. I'm really excited to hear about this. So can you talk about accessibility and software development? Ah, for Joyce. Joyce, this is a good one for Joyce because you know we're using some of her software. Exactly. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear so, you. So Joyce, could could you tell us more about how to create more accessibility around software development? Okay, thank you very much. You know, this is another area that we hope to see move for, uh, further. Not all companies are like Highmark, where they understand that without digital accessibility, people who are blind or deaf or have a learning disability or an intellectual disability, uh, or, you know, or use, need a mobility device can work the way everyone else works. So what is happening now is there a, is going to be, as we move forward, a bigger emphasis in this country where they will be enforcing that, you know, companies are accessible. Because as my friend Eve Hill said, uh, at the White House when she was with the Department of Justice during the Obama administration, she said, how can I work for you if I can't even apply with your application? Hmm. employment application or how can I keep my job if the internal applications are not accessible so uh, digital accessibility is critical our software product that David uh, was mentioning I disability was designed solely by people with disabilities uh, with 100% accessibility uh, and sadly, a lot of them aren't like that. But as I said, I see a bigger emphasis as we move forward on digital accessibility. And, and it helps all of us. I mean, so that's, that's the thing. It helps all of us. It's not mm -hmm. just that it's catered towards one, you know, specific kind of population or one kind of label. It, it, these solutions affect all of us. It affects mm -hmm. the use of our, the ease of use of our interface. It, 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 it allows us to have accessibility in ways that we didn't even think about before. So uh, that's the thing that I think everyone needs to realize is that it's really for all of us and it's not exclusive. So um, Karen Feinstein, I think, has a, a, um, a question on there. I'm on my phone, so I can't quite yeah, see all the chats. I got you covered here, Audrey. So Karen okay. wants to know, she says, we've learned that COVID-19 can itself create long-term disability. What are both organizations doing to protect us? Residents oh, wow. from potential contagion from returning college students. Um, Amherst, Massachusetts has developed a town-wide plan. So far. Yeah, so let me take a, a, a shot at it. First of all, um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, we're working very closely with the Department of Health, uh, but we're also working closely with the other health systems. In fact, in fact Dr. Don Whiting, uh, led the initiative where, you know, the six major health systems in Western Pennsylvania are all now working together, the, the chief medical officers, um, in addressing, you know, the COVID-19 crisis and trying to advise uh, both the state and local officials on, on how to, you know, to address things. Um, clearly, you know, back to school is, is, is going to be the next hurdle that we face. And um, I am proud to say that in Western Pennsylvania, as painful as it's been, much of the work that's been done, you know, the sacrifice people have made to social distance, to wear masks, to uh, maybe eat outside versus inside, all of those things have enabled us to, you know, go through what uh, I would consider two rounds of this um, and, and hold our ground, meaning we didn't overwhelm the hospitals, we didn't overwhelm you know, the healthcare system, we were able to keep the, you know, the infection rate, the transfer rate at a reasonable level. And so, um, and that's part of the key to this, is we're going to have um, COVID-19 infections. And the question is, you know, is how fast they, uh, they go through the community and can we manage this in an orderly way until there is an immunization available uh, and that enough people have either had the infection or the shots in order to be able to get to herd immunity, if you want to call it that. So in this region, it's really about um, making sure that we use the common sense stuff. Uh, all the health systems, including the Allegheny Health Network, are uh, locked and loaded and ready to, um, to deal with what comes their way. Um, you know, we've learned a lot from the first round, you know, on clinical protocols and how to take care of, of patients who do get the virus. 
Uh, but the best thing we can do is, you know, try to limit exposure once somebody has symptoms, you know, because that's going to keep the transfer um, more, more of a steady state. Allegheny Health Network specifically is working with Carnegie Mellon on their back to school strategies and helping uh, with, you know, not only uh, you know, clinical advice, mm -hmm. but also resources to be able to address outbreaks. Other people are doing you know, similar things with the various universities. But as universities come back together, um, as kids go back to school, you know, we can expect outbreaks. And, and it's going to be a matter of how quickly we, um, we jump on it and how quickly we use contact, contact tracing, uh, which Karen's very familiar with, in order to, um, to help slow down that, that transference of the virus. Mm -hmm. are we, okay. And I think one of the things that um, maybe the next time we get some physicians on that can talk to us about any of the side effects of getting COVID and what that means for the population at large. Yes, I mean, you know, that certainly would be a, a terrific thing to do. I would, would mm -hmm. tell you that, um, you know, it's, there's so much that's not known. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, why certain people are able to weather the storm fairly easily right. and then others, you know, uh, have challenges. Uh, certainly one of the decisions that the, um, the Big Ten just made was on the basis of not that these kids were, weren't super healthy and, and athletes, mm -hmm. but what was the long-term impact of having the virus on the heart muscle? And, mm -hmm. you know, and did it pose an additional risk uh, mm -hmm. for, for the, that group of people? So uh, Dr. Don Whiting or Dr. Uh, Brian Parker would be glad to join you and, and, and fill you in. Yeah, that, that would be fabulous. So I know we're running at 1230 and I want to be sensitive to time to everyone and uh, appreciate if there's been any noise in the background from me in my hut in uh, Tahiti. I know that uh, there's been some noise in the background and I want to apologize for that. But if you want any more information about Bender Consulting, you can uh, reach out to benderconsulting.com and uh, it's easy to find Joyce and, and also Mary is probably somewhere on this chat making herself available and uh, all things that relate to Highmark are really easy to find. They're strong partners of ours, really caring about what we're doing in the tech community and trying to build the future for tomorrow. They don't have the answers. None of us have all the answers, but we certainly are trying to figure out some ways to make what we do and where we live even better. And Speaking of that, I'd like to tell you about tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to be addressing issues that I'm terming, I'm using the term child care um, augmentation. And the thing is, is that we really want you to see what's happening right here in our tech community with entrepreneurs that include companies like Bird Brain, that include Shell Games, as well as Flexible. And so they are each doing different things to make sure that there's the right supports in place for any kind of hybrid learning, any remote learning and opportunities so that we can live this new life that changes the way we work and think. So this is Audrey Russo. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you tomorrow. Deep appreciation to Joyce Bender and huge appreciation as well to David. And remember the challenge, Highmark 3030, you too can do the same thing. So thank you, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.